Hey, podcast listeners, Rhea Wong with you once again with Nonprofit Lowdown. Today is a little bit of a different interview. I'm speaking with my friend, Teresa Schechter. She is a documentary filmmaker and an advocate for reproductive freedom. And we are talking to her because she recently completed a very interesting documentary film called My So-Called Selfish Life about women who are choosing to not have children. So we're going to get into that and we're going to talk about how that relates to the nonprofit sector. But Teresa, welcome to the show. Thank you. So great to be here. So before we jump way into it, I'd love to hear a little bit about yourself and your evolution as a filmmaker, and in particular, My So-Called Selfish Life, which I just saw. It was wonderful. So funny. You know, you wouldn't necessarily think a film about not having kids would be as funny as it is. Um, but yeah, tell me about, about yourself and why this topic. Sure. Um, I've been making documentaries for about 20 years, and I like to describe them as uh, sort of exploring and confronting prickly unspoken realities of women's lives. Um, I really love telling stories with humor, with a lot of pop culture, with a lot of personal stories. Um, and um, the latest one, My So-Called Selfish Life, is about, um, you know, one of our greatest social taboos, which is not becoming a mother and everything around that. Um, I have always been really frustrated at the lack of narratives that mirror how my own life has moved forward um, as someone who, you know, was single until I was in my late forties, who never had children, who does not look like a Victoria's Secret model, all of these things. And I, and I just found so little reflection in media and pop culture of living that kind of life and living it happily because we see it, but not in a way that represents people actually being happy and satisfied with that life. So that's a, that's a big thing. And I think all of my films have um, some things in common that do touch on what it means to be denied control of our reproductive lives. Um, because I, I think if you can't control your reproductive life, you, can't control the rest of your life and yeah so on purpose. so true. i know well so you and i when we first talked you talked about pronatalism that was the first time i'd ever heard of it so can you walk us through like what does it mean what does pronatalist mean and how do you see it showing up in these i mean almost i would say insidious ways in our culture <laughs> Yeah, um, so pronatalism is a word I didn't even fully understand when I started making my so-called selfish life. I was really interested in exploring the lives of women without children. And I should say at this point, when I use the word women, I'm using it in a sort of historical sociological sense um, of uh, an oppressed class of people. Um, of course, there are people with uteruses who are not women. There are people who are women um, who, sorry, I need to start that again. Um, there are people who don't have uteruses who are women. There are people who do have uteruses who aren't women. Um, so I just want to be clear on that. But I think that the term woman really encapsulates a certain kind of history and sociology of a certain group of people. So, um, so I was interested in, in our lives, lives of people who haven't had children. And um, the more research I did, the more I realized that the sort of the fundamental basis of all of this exploration is this idea of pronatalism, which is um, basically a series of pressures. Uh, they might come from society, they might come from family, they might come from religion, they might come from pop culture, but all really promoting or encouraging childbearing. Um, that's essentially what pronatalism is. It's the kind of thing where we're like fish swimming in water and we don't realize we're in water. We don't realize we're in a pronatalist world because it's so embedded in our lives. Um, it can be anything from sitting down at Thanksgiving dinner and your aunt asks you for the hundredth time when you're giving your parents grandchildren. Um, it can be, um, one of my favorite examples are commercials for pregnancy tests where you really never see anyone getting a negative and being happy about it. It's always, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant, I'm so happy. Many people are very happy to be pregnant, but 
really there's no alternative in the world of pregnancy test commercials. Um, and it can be something like state programs that promote childbearing, which can be fairly benign, you know, offering some government benefits um, to things that are incredibly harmful. Like, for example, when people cite how abortion bans will help grow the population. So this is all pronatalism. Um, and it's a really handy kind of lens to look at how we make choices about our lives and um, what pressures are out there influencing those choices, whether we realize it or not. It's a huge, huge thing, pronatalism. But once you sort of start thinking about it, you kind of start seeing it everywhere, right? Like yeah, things totally. you never noticed before. Yep. Oh, pronatalism. Yeah. yeah. Well, and imagine how frightening it must be to some people to have independent, financially secure women who can do whatever the hell they want. <laughs> it's it's like their worst nightmare. I mean, yeah. really, this, I mean, this underlies so many things, and I don't want to get into a whole um, talk about oppression, but it, in so many ways, the protectors of the classic nuclear family, the one man, one woman, two children, preferably white and Christian, is is a heavily protected concept. And anything that goes against that idea, women living single who are happy, women without children who are fulfilled, uh, people who have same-sex partners who are perfectly happy and fulfilled, um, all of these things. Um, you know, getting to figure out what what gender you are and living that way is an incredible threat <laughs> to the nuclear family where men and men are men and women are women. And so yeah, it's it's you know, people like. Tucker Carlson watch a video of, that Chelsea Handler makes because she's kind of the queen of these videos now. And they're they're bursting blood vessels in their temples because it's so, so threatening. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We're not going to go down that road because if we do, we're just going to be here forever yeah, yeah. and my, my head is going to explode. Feel but... free to cut that right out. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think it's an important point though yeah. because what I hear you saying is that you're creating uh stories and alternative narratives to the mainstream right that like you can be different and still be happy <laughs> you don't have to follow this one path because this one path may not be for you and it doesn't mean that you are less than it doesn't mean i mean um i've had people say like well if you don't have kids like you'll never truly know what love is i'm like really <laughs> anyway but i but i will also say and i think this is an important point is that we have to also buck against these stereotypes that like women who choose not to have children, like don't like kids or they're somehow less feminine or, you know, or, and I thought this was an interesting point you brought up in the movie, which is that often people who choose not to have children put a lot more thought into that decision than people who do have children. So uh, all to say that I think that there's a lot of, you know, myths that we can debunk about people who choose not to have children as just like a personal choice. Even people who want children and for whatever reasons cannot have them get a lot, a lot of the same kinds of, I'm going to use the word abuse um, over this. The fact that they don't have children somehow diminishes them as people, um, diminishes them as women because they're not mothers. Um, so it's not even just people who choose not to have children. It's people who don't have children for many reasons. Um, we are all being lumped into this sort of less than where motherhood is the pinnacle and anyone who hasn't sort of reached that pinnacle is not, is, you know. So, yeah, it's, uh, again, pronatalism. Yeah. It's for dinner. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's talk about nonprofits because this is no nonprofit lowdown. So I think in the nonprofit world we t we try I think most of us to think about policies that are inclusive and equitable. Um, and one area that I think is a really interesting one that you brought up is the fact that you know we want to extend uh, what do they call it FMLA? You know, uh, right? What do they call that? Oh, uh, the family leave. 
Act. Yeah, Family, family Leave Act. Medical but, leave act yeah, MLA. but you know, paternity and maternity leave mm-hmm. um, to parents. And yet we don't talk about extending rights to people who don't have children. So what's my question here? I guess the question is like, how might a nonprofit start to think about equity in through the lens of understanding that we live in this pro-natalist world? And, you know, to be fair, before I get the hate mail, I know y'all are out there being like, I know that raising a child is not a vacation. Okay. Like I get that. However... <laughs> Absolutely. I think we also have to look at the fact from it through an equity perspective that, you know, people who have children are getting benefits that people who choose not to have children are getting. So how might we we thread that needle? Right. Yeah. And and absolutely. And I this was so important in making the film also. Uh, we're not bashing parents. This is not a zero sum game. We could all live in a world that makes our lives more meaningful and less difficult, um, especially around our workplace, around the organizations that serve us. So this is for everyone, really. Um, I think the first thing in challenging these, um, you know, these pronatalist biases that are inside all of us, because how could they not be? Because we grow up in this world that keeps reinforcing this, um, is to understand that, that we have pronatalist biases. Um, and we just have to really consider things through that lens. So if we are prioritizing prioritizing the needs of parents to the detriment of other employees who are not parents, um, that's an equity issue. Um, if we're prioritizing people who are in nuclear family structures, traditional nuclear family structures to the detriment of employees who aren't, that is that is also an issue. Um, I think we have to really ask ourselves, like, what do families look like? And this is a big thing in DEI now. You know, what what do families look like? How are the many ways we can make families? Um, and how do we honor all of those different choices um, in ways that give everyone the, the equity in, in the workplace? So For me, I think the biggest challenge is that the onus of change has to be on leadership. Employees cannot fix these problems on their own. They can bring attention to them, but this is a management issue. And for just for example, just one pretty common example is um, vacation time. Um, You know, if you're if you're putting in for vacation time, there are some organizations and uh, where there's preferential treatment for people with families. Um, I don't think that's equitable. I don't think that families should be the ones that are getting Christmas vacation off and people without quote unquote families are not, you know, even, even if we don't have children, we may have parents that we'd like to see on our holiday breaks, just, you know, for example. So but these are all leadership things. I hear over and over again that employees are asked by management to work it out for themselves, which is really bad, really bad management. There should be policies, and there should not only be policies; they should be uh, enforced in you know in a way that makes sense. So, I mean, I think a lot of these things apply to any workplace, but especially if organizations are working on these issues themselves, um, these are the kind of things that are really important to be aware of. And um, again, ask leadership to to take the lead (laughs) in making it happen. Yeah. You know, as you're talking about it, it it feels like there are some parallels here between um, other biases like racism or ableism or, you know, uh, whatever ism that you can think of and pro-natalism, right? Because it wasn't until you and I started talking that I was like, oh, wait a second. Like I, I have, despite the fact that I've chosen not to have children, have pro-natalist biases because we're swimming in this soup. So what would some um, policies look like as an example that would be not pro-natalist? That was a double negative. Anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Not for, yeah. Um, 
again, I think the first thing is just to be aware of it. Be aware of how certain kinds of lives and families are being privileged. Um, this is not to say that people without with people with children should not be given time off to take care of their children. It's a massive job, but that really should not be at the detriment of everyone else. And they really should not be held up as the only people who can leave early, for example, because they have to pick up kids. People have to leave early for a lot of different reasons. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm a filmmaker. I made this film about child-free lives and all of the social issues around that. So I'm not making policy for um, organizations, but I think there are just things to be aware of. I mean, that is really the first thing, um, you know, access to uh, equitable treatment in terms of human resources. But also if you're an organization that's working with medical practitioners, for example, um, there is very little conversation about the desire for many people to have a sterilization procedure done, for example. Um, it's something that doesn't really get talked about, and yet it is a massive issue for a lot of people. They want to get their tubes tied or their tubes removed. Um, they don't ever want to be pregnant. Um, there is really not enough attention being paid to that, especially now, post row, where the demand for sterilization procedures for um, tubal ligations, but also vasectomies has skyrocketed because people are terrified of not being able to control their fertility. So if you're working for an organization that is supporting medical practitioners, or if you're a medical practitioner yourself, and you are not willing to talk to your patients or talk to your organizations about these procedures, because you, with your internalized pronatalism, think, oh, someone will regret that. They'll change their minds. They don't know what they want or what's best for them, um, which is a pretty common response when someone under the age of 40 asks to have their tubes removed. Um, this is a real issue in terms of you know, patient-centered care, either for your folks or the folks that you're supporting. Um, there are other issues like automatically talking about egg freezing. Like whoever, whoever shows up, it's like, Let's let's talk about egg freezing and supporting egg freezing without really questioning the efficacy of egg freezing, um, or uh, why you're pushing egg freezing on everyone. So again, the re, any any sort of reproductive services organizations like that, there is a lot of internalized pronatalism that is not serving this idea of patient centered care, which I think should be the goal of of um, this kind of work. Um, so, of, sorry. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, as we think about uh, the folks coming into nonprofit, they tend to be, you know, younger, millennial, Gen Z. What are some of the trends that we see in fertility? Like anecdotally, I've heard that women are, <laughs> that we are seeing a birth decline and particularly because of economic pressures, women are having children later if they decide to do it at all. Is that correlating with the data that you're seeing? What, what we're seeing is there is a decline in the fertility rate. Um, there is not a decline in population. Population continues to grow very robustly. And there are people who uh, are pushing this idea that population is declining and there's some sort of bottom will fall out thing is really not happening. However, <laughs> the fertility rate is declining. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that. One of the reasons is that teen pregnancies have gone down significantly, profoundly. Um, less teenagers are, are having babies um, because of the availability of, of birth control. The fact that many nonprofits have created all of these programs uh, to get um, long lasting birth control made available, affordable, really good things. I don't know where that's going in our current US climate. So that's one reason. Um, people are um, waiting later to have children. They are having fewer children. Um, more and more families are having one child and stopping there. And by the way, the pronatalist pressure on those families are also <laughs> excruciating. Only one, you need to have another. Um, 
And yeah, some some young people, you know, really cite economic issues, climate issues, um, issues around not finding the right partner, not wanting to be a single parent. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of things that go on in our lives. Our lives are complicated as we go through them. Um, but according to a Pew Research survey, which was done a couple of years ago through the Pew Research Center, the majority of, I think it's 18 to 49 year olds um, who were um, asked if they were planning to have children. So first of all, 44% of those people said they were not gonna have children or probably were not gonna have children. Um, and they cited a lot of different reasons, but by far, by far the majority of people said the reason they weren't having children is because they didn't want to have children. That's a good enough reason. <laughs> I believe said no, I just don't want children. Because I don't want to. Because I don't want to. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is a, a huge, huge um, number of people. And, and Q, you know, is an incredibly reputable uh, research organization. And um, those numbers are really um, very telling. People don't want children because they don't want children. They may have other reasons as well, but ultimately, if those reasons didn't exist, they still wouldn't want children. So there's a lot going on, definitely. Um, I think a lot of times people are really obsessed with the reasons people give for not having children. Like, why don't you want children? We don't ask parents why they have children pretty much ever. Right, 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 um, right. But why don't you have children? And I think they're asking because they think they can come up with a policy that will fix that and make people have more children. Oh, it's the economy. We'll give you some baby bonuses. You know, we'll give you some money. We'll give you some tax breaks. Those really don't work that well because you know why? Because the majority of people just don't want children. So, <laughs> so. And, uh, let's go back to this idea of pronatalism because I think um, – the way that you talked about it in the film, which I thought was really interesting, is the is how it's so connected to uh, like white supremacy and racism and forced sterilization of black women and you know eugenics and who gets to decide who has children and how many and of what race. So it's a little bit of a detour, but I, I do think it's worth noting, especially for those of us in the nonprofit world, that you know we're all out here trying to fight against you know racism and oppression and all the things. So how how is pronatalism tied to a lot of these very oppressive um, practices and ideas? I mean, pronatalism is ultimately used to control reproduction. It's a way to control reproduction, depending on what your end goal is. And this is happening more and more now. It happened a hundred years ago, this idea that there are too many immigrants and we need white people to have more babies. This is a really common refrain in conservative circles. And um, so pronatalism is being used for the purposes of white nationalism and white supremacy to try to convince white middle-class women to have more babies or force them to have more babies because of this perceived um, threat by immigrants. This is all perceived. This is all racism, nationalism, white supremacy, often Christian supremacy. Um, and we saw this a hundred years ago. We saw 150 years ago, the way the U S dealt with it was to forcibly sterilize many, many groups of people that were considered undesirable to reproduce, which included um, black people, people of color, disabled people, um, poor people sometimes, women who were considered uh, promiscuous, which meant they probably got pregnant um, with, with outside of marriage. Um, it's, a, it's a way to control the population to the ends that the people in control want. This is really important for organizations to understand that there are all these things happening, these undercurrents, these social undercurrents that are not such undercurrents anymore. I said earlier that there, um, 
uh, conservative groups that think that the abortion ban is great because it's going to make more people have children. And when they say make more people have children, they're mostly talking about like white people, honestly. Yeah. So this is all going on in our society. So if we're working with people of color, if we're working with uh, different groups that have faced oppressions, we really need to understand what the history is and what the social forces are right now that are uh, seeking to control their reproduction and their lives. Um, we go into this a lot in the film. It's just a really important part of the story. It's not just babies crying on airplanes and we have some clickbait story of some child-free person saying, I hate babies. I want child-free flights, which is by far the most common story I hear on the topic of people without children. We need to get rid of the clickbaity stuff and talk about these real issues that affect. Well, true story. I'm sure people with children would prefer not to have Oh. A flight with children. <laughs> Nobody likes babies crying on airplanes. Nobody likes sitting in a restaurant where children are running around oh my screaming. God. Nobody <laughs> likes that. Who likes that? I feel bad for the parents that are dealing with this or not. But yeah, again, our, we're dangerous. So any way to discredit those of us who are living lives outside the sort of nuclear family norm are, are dangerous. Yeah. Anything to discredit us is... yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably. No, I, I mean, it's, it's funny, not funny. It's not funny. It's like, at the face of it, you're like, okay, people who choose not to have children, like, okay, like, that seems like, not that deep, really. But then when you go down the rabbit hole of how pronatalist policies reinforce white nationalism, and white supremacy, and like, uphold a certain kind of structure, that outside of the, to your point, the white nuclear family, others you then it becomes like political right you're like wait a second hold on it's not just a single person deciding not to have kids it's like tied to this whole it's of a piece right like a it's, i'm almost thinking about like a yarn ball like you pull on the thread and the whole thing starts to unravel you're like wait a second yeah and I think that that if you are serving if your organization is serving a population you really need to understand what's going on on this level, on this pronatalist level. I, you know, there's some really large uh, reproductive and sexual health organizations that barely even mention the choice to be child-free. Like it's not even part of their, it's all about healthy pregnancies and access to reproductive health care, all very important things. But I often just for fun go to some of these websites and look and see what they have to say about people who choose not to have children, even from a medical standpoint. It's not really there. You do find things about uh, protecting your health as a young woman because you're considered pre-pregnant. That's there. Now, finally, we have these organizations saying if and when you have children. So the if has been put in there, which I think is a, is a good thing, but yeah, really it's, it's just not there. And yeah. again, if you're serving communities around reproductive healthcare, for example, you need to serve the whole community. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you need to serve the whole community. And I will also say that this is, and I, and I'm saying all of this because I think this is a matter of awareness. Just, I don't, I don't think people are, are bad. I think everyone goes to work wanting to do good in the world. And there's just a lack of awareness around all of these issues. The way we talk about abortion bans, for example, we hear a lot of really horrible stories about fetal anomalies, pregnancies that will never result in a healthy baby's birth, um, women being forced to carry these fetuses that have no chance of surviving. These are really dominating the news and they're horrible and they're a great example of how cruel the bans are. However, those, those are a pretty small percentage of people who need abortion care. Most people just don't want to be pregnant. They just don't want to be pregnant. And I think that being able to make the decision that you don't want to be pregnant and then having a procedure where you're no longer pregnant is a basic human right. Um, and again, I, I have some frustration with, with um, maybe some of the larger reproductive rights nonprofits where 
they will not acknowledge that most people just don't want to be pregnant because that's not really because of pronatalism that's not the acceptable narrative right right right? um if i say i'm getting an abortion because i never want children and i am pregnant and i do not want to be pregnant and i do not want to be forced to give birth that's not a good narrative for them yeah it's it's so interesting too because at the same time that we are banning women's rights to abortions there's also unprecedented amounts of money being spent on things like ivf and egg freezing and all of the and i'm presuming people spend a ton of money on adoption and other ways to be parents and that's socially acceptable so um to your point i think we as a as a society if we are interested in building a more equitable workplace or a more equitable future we should be aware of the fact that we are swimming in this pronatalist soup and that there are assumptions and biases that we are bringing to the table that we're, we don't even realize. Actually, it was just, as you were talking, I was thinking about The Handmaid's Tale, which yeah. like yes. seemed at the time it was published like oh. know, this dystopian future that could never happen. And it's like increasingly the reality of the world, which where, you know, women are being seen as like uh, yeah, womb carriers, right? Like, oh, we, we see the, your value as mm-hmm. being able to reproduce humans. Right. And, you know, if if your organization is working with communities of color, you probably already know that it has been this way uh, for communities of color all the time. Like, it's always been difficult to get an abortion. It's always been difficult to get good reproductive health care. Um, I think that with with the overturning of Roe, people who hadn't had that those difficulties to that extent suddenly realized what was going on. But this has always been a, a problem. It's always been an issue. And, um, you know, we like to bring out that Handmaid's Tale, you know, analogy. But this is, this is, the world has always been like this for people without, as many rights as others it's always been thus um, yeah if the end of row is bringing more attention to it right that's really really good mm-hmm. um, but ha- not being able to do what we please with our own bodies is a, a really big big issue and mm-hmm. i'm going to extend that from abortion to um trans affirming care Oh my God. I just listened to the daily podcast this morning about how, okay, please continue. I, 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 I mean, couldn't even yeah. finish listening to it. It was so upsetting. I, I was just reading a paper on, on why um, abortion care and trans affirming care are deeply, deeply connected. And it's not just because the people seeking them out are again, going against the, <laughs> the norm um, of how we should be behaving, but our bodies are ours to do with what we wish we are supposed to be controlling our own bodies. And if we cannot get the kind of care that will allow us to make decisions about our bodies and our futures, that is reproductive oppression and it is trans oppression and everything is interrelated. It's, it's all about control at the end. It's all about control. And again, I'm saying all this because I think that that in a lot of cases, there's just a lack of awareness of of these issues and how they all fit together. And um, so there are communities being left out and there are communities being harmed. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Such a good point. So as we round the corner here, and and I know, you know, HR may not be your specialty, but (laughs) if you were to advise a nonprofit executive, because those are the people who listen to this podcast and they would say, Teresa, you're right. How might we do an assessment of pronatalist policies that we may not have even been aware of? Like, what would be a first step? Okay, so I think that's a really, really good question. And that's the first step, which is a really good first step. Um, I think that that leadership needs to take responsibility for this. I don't think it can be passed off to employees. I think that if you start with this idea that all your employees are equal, like truly equal and entitled to the same benefits the same care, how do you do that? 
how do you make policies that are equitable in terms of time off, equitable in terms of when people get to take their vacations, um, equitable in terms of what leave looks like and what family leave looks like and what the definition of family is when we're talking about family leave. Um, these are all questions just to, to ask yourselves. What, what is a family? Who do we care about as a family? Um, and I wanna recommend an organization called the New Legacy Institute. I'm an advisor to the New Legacy Institute. And uh, they work on these issues for people without children, whether by choice or circumstance. Um, and they want to work directly with leadership to talk through these issues, the DEI issues, legal issues. Um, I believe that there is like a sort of a DEI uh, cheat sheet that they have on the site, you know, just some questions to consider right out of the gate. Um, I think if we're going to assume that leadership cares about its employees, then they have to care about all their employees and they have to honor all the different ways people live, all the different ways people make families. Um, it's time to do that. And it's not, not going to take anything away from parents. Mm -hmm. This is not, again, a zero sum game, but there has to be some idea of equitable time off, whether you're taking that as leave, as, as uh, parental leave, or you're taking that for whatever other reason you have to take leave. Right. Um, you know, it's not, you don't have to explain yourself. If you're an employee and your company is offering leave, you should be entitled to that leave. Yeah. Whatever, you, whatever you're doing with it. Um, good point. And I will make sure to put the link to the new Legacy Institute in the show notes along with your information. Teresa, uh, last question from you. As you were making this film, any big surprises for you? Anything that, you know, was unexpected for you? <laughs> Um, pronatalism <laughs> was, was very unexpected. Honestly, I went into this with a completely different idea of what I was wanting to do. Um, and, uh, sort of discovering this concept of pronatalism kind of pulled everything together. It's like when you discover the word patriarchy and you're like, oh, that actually makes sense of so many things in my world. And, and pronatalism is, is the same way. Like, oh, that makes sense of all these things that it didn't make any sense to me. I think that was really surprising. But the other thing that was very surprising to me was I, I do a lot of college screenings and how many college students were not even aware that it was an option not to have children, which was pretty shocking to me. I don't know why I was shocked at this. But, but that was very, very surprising. We were doing test screenings with, with college students and then actual screenings. And many, many people were like, oh, I didn't realize you could just not have children. I'm not evangelical about this. I think people should do what they want to do. But that's kind of the operative phrase, what they want to do and have time to think about that. So that was really surprising. And then the other thing that was surprising in my research, but again, should not have been it's just the way that the, the topic of choosing whether or not to have children is so different for so many different groups. You know, the film has a lot of representation of um, women of color and their history of reproductive oppression really informs their sort of present day choices and the way their community uh, interacts with them around the choice not to have children, which is, which is, different in many ways from my own experience as, as a white woman with a very different history. So it's the, I realized how very white child-free space was and how very much we needed to hear from people who, who weren't white. And um, that should not have been a surprise. And yet it was like, oh, right. There's just a lot more stories to tell. So I, I, I really hope that the folks that participated in the film have added to that storytelling. Yeah, it was interesting as I was watching it. I, I don't recall that there was an Asian woman 
in the film. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's also a story to tell about, you know, the expectations of family and generations and like, of course, you're going to have children. And so when you when I decide not to, like, what does that mean about my place within the family? So anyway, maybe no, that a part two. You're absolutely right. No, you're absolutely right. We we don't have um, Asian representation at the level that I would like to have it. Um, and that was an interesting issue in finding people who are willing to talk about this on camera. Who have, <laughs> I wish we'd met. I would have talked about this all day. I know. Now, now I'm, I'm meeting people. But, you know, people who haven't talked to their families about it, for example, who, you know, the, the woman in the film who's getting a sterilization procedure, I don't know if her parents even know yet that she did this. Uh, but she wanted to be in the film because she wanted to tell her story. And I did speak to many Asian women about this. And there was an, a shocking reluctance, maybe not shocking, to go on, on the record, to go on camera. Interesting. Um, it was really interesting. It's it's one of the things I, I acknowledge is missing from the film. And part of that was just a really long process of um, trying to get people to take part and then them dropping out or oh, wanting yeah. to go on the record or, which again, really shows what a contentious topic this still is. All right. Last thing I, I want to say is I really appreciated that you highlighted your mother and the fact that she never pressured you to have kids much in the way that I am grateful that my mother never pressured me. In fact, at one point when I was in my twenties, she goes, you know, Rhea, you really like to sleep. So I think it's probably best that you don't have kids. <laughs> I was like, you are correct, mom. <laughs> I do like to sleep. Yeah. Um, I have great parents. I'm really lucky. Um, I, I feel really, I think it's a really gift to have parents that support you you know, with whatever you want to do with your life. Um, and I knew I wanted my mother in the film because she's somewhat of an iconoclast. She hates Mother's Day, for example. We never celebrated Mother's Day at home because she thought it was a really insensitive holiday, actually. And she didn't think women should be congratulated, should have a holiday because they had a child. Um, that was always her take. And um, she's got two children. Uh, we love her, but we don't celebrate Mother's Day with her. Um, I think one nice thing that the film has done is it's brought families together um, in the, the streaming um, periods that we've had for the film. Um, I get a lot of emails from people who watch the film with, with their parents or watch the film with their kids. And, and it really prompted some nice conversations. And that's the kind of thing that makes me really happy. So last question, I know I keep saying last question, but if folks want to see this film, which I highly recommend that you do, because it's very, whether you have kids or you don't have kids, it is very thought provoking. Where can people watch it? So right now it is streaming globally, uh, streaming on demand, launched today uh, as we speak, as we record this. Um, uh, I'm sure you can, you can put the URL in, but also if you just go to our film's website, which is myselfishlife.com mm -hmm. or my so called selfishlife.com, if you want to type more, um, both those uh, URLs will get you to our website. And at the very top of the website is the link to stream the film. So awesome. I invite everyone to, to check it out and watch it with their with their families if they've wanted to have the talk. <laughs> this yeah. Is the way to start it. Awesome. Well, Teresa, thank you so much for all that you have done to open up our eyes to the pronatalism that we are all swimming in. It's a wonderful film. I recommend everyone go and stream it now. Um, and more to more to talk about to be continued. I hope this is one of many conversations. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, hold on. Why am I not? Remiss?